for some more people on Zoom. We'll get started at 630. Deborah, you are not on visual, so you are good to go. We'll kind of try to keep people off both the visual and the audio while the presentation is going on, so not to distract from anyone. A few more minutes. If you're on with us on Facebook Live, please stay with us until 6.30 when we get started for another Northern Kentucky History Hour presented by Beringer Crawford Museum. I think next time I do this, I'm going to add some lobby music just to get it. Welcome, welcome, everyone. Let's see, we have another good turnout tonight. Couple more minutes, we'll get started here with Julia. And I'll give her a proper introduction so everybody will know who she is. What playlist would you choose if we were to play music? Uh, it would just be just random elevator music. <laughs> you wouldn't want to hear the music I listen to. It's it's pretty hard and loud. <laughs> Just curious. <laughs> I mean, if it was up to me, it'd be ACDC or Black Sabbath or Led Zeppelin, but and that might turn people off, so. Well, something between Frank Sinatra and ACDC would probably hit a crowd. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys for joining us all tonight. We'll get started here in about another minute or so. Those of you on Facebook Live, we're just waiting for a few more people on Zoom and we'll get started. Once again, this is Sparinger Crawford Museum's Northern Kentucky History Hour. Welcome, welcome. A lot of people coming in right now. I think we'll get started here at 6.30. Thank you all for joining us. For those on Facebook Live, welcome as well. It's my pleasure to welcome the Northern Kentucky History Hour. I'm the host for tonight, Joe Weber. I've been on the Beringer Crawford Museum Board for about five years now. I'm not a local Kenton County resident. I'm actually uh, born in Cincinnati, but moved here when I got married about six years ago. I'm also a member of the Kenton County Historical Society, uh, and I, I'm a teacher at Newport Central Catholic High School, so on the other side uh, in that Campbell County area, but that's okay. We want to, first of all, thank Tara and Shane Nome for running this history hour for over the last year and really getting people excited about Barringer Property Museum and history in general. Um, but this, this week and weeks to come, we'll be transitioning to other hosts, such as myself, um, and other members of the board and other people involved in our museum. So we wanna thank you for joining us. The Northern Kentucky History Hour is a project of the Beringer Crawford Museum, Northern Kentucky's History Museum. Beringer Crawford Museum, of course, is supported by a part of the city of Covington, the Kenton County Fiscal Court, Arts Wave, Kentucky Arts Council, Northern Kentucky Sports Hall of Fame, the Carol Ann and Ralph V. Hale Jr. US Bank Foundation and our members. If you're not yet a member of the museum, please consider joining us for access to discounts and exclusive programming. Learn more and join at bcmmuseum.org. 
Before we begin, let's go over a few reminders. Everyone's microphones have been muted so we can all focus on the presentation. Uh, feel free to turn off your video, which I believe has already been done. Uh, otherwise, others can see you on the call. If you have any questions or comments to share, please type it in the chat and we will try to get to as many questions as possible immediately following the presentation. So that's the chat either on Zoom or on Facebook Live, wherever you're watching this program. Also, there will be a quiz question tonight after the presentation. The first respondent to enter a correct answer in the chat on Zoom or on Facebook Live wins the Northern Kentucky History Hour pin and of course, bragging rights. So let's meet tonight's speaker. Julia Fair lives in Fort Thomas with her fiance Casey and their cats Homer and George. In 2019, Julia moved to the area to report on Northern Kentucky governments for the Cincinnati Inquirer through the Report for America program, which places journalists in undercover in different areas. The job is part journalism and part detective work. One of her big stories was when local residents expressed fears about a chemical storage plant. Fair listened and investigated and followed up with articles detailing questionable maneuvers by the chemical company. And when she read an ad from the Kentucky Department of Transportation seeking the next of kin for a family buried in an independence intersection that needs to be widened, she called on the community to send her clues to identify the remains. Julia, welcome. Thanks for having me. It's great to uh, have you here, and I'm really excited to hear about this uh, story that you've uh, uncovered. Oh yeah, great. So um, um, like Joe said, uh, my name is Julia Fair. Um, I cover Northern Kentucky um, governments for the Cincinnati Inquirer, and we all know how many governments there are um, in Northern Kentucky, so I'm always um, keeping busy. And so this story that we're going to kind of talk about tonight, um, it's one of the more, I, I feel like, lighthearted things that I was able to um, spend some time on. Um, and it all started with a classifieds ad that um, a reader actually let me know about. Um, a, a good majority of, of my articles often come from reader questions. They always email me like, hey, like I saw this thing. Can you figure out more about it? Um, and then I did. So I'm going to share my screen. And Joe, can you see the presentation? Oh, I can't hear you now. Yeah, sorry. Yes, oh, okay. I can see it. Sorry. Okay, great, great. Um, so yeah, so this is my contact information here. Because um, like I said, um, this story came from um, a reader comment or um, email. And so feel free to email me anytime about anything you see going on in Northern Kentucky. Um, it doesn't have to be um, an investigative thing. It can be um, related to history, like this story is about um, I always like to know um, what's going on um, and just hear from you guys because, you know, I've lived here for two years now. Um, so everybody who's lived here for any time longer than that, um, you know, you guys know what's going on in your community. And this um, phone number here, that is my work cell phone number. So feel free to um, call or text me at that anytime too. Because I, I always like to say we can't have community journalism um, without the community and that's you guys. So let's get started. So like I said, um, a lot of the stories um, that I write about comes from reader comments or emails. And so um, it always comes from people all the time. So I heard from Lisa Foster. She lives in Taylor Mill. And she's the one who actually read the classifieds ad about the cemetery that was going to be moved. So, um, you know, the ad um, was pretty vague. Um, uh, she told me that, you know, she was hoping that more publicity about this cemetery that was going to be moved might bring about more identification. So it was in the Kenton County Recorder. Um, and the, here's basically what the ad said. It said it was a six plus plot unknown cemetery um, that was in the way of the proposed um, expansion of KY 536 in Independence. Um, that's all the ad really said. They said they were gonna run the ad until um, a late April. Um, and then um, if the Mexican wasn't found, they were going to move it to the um, remains to another cemetery. And so why even move the cemetery? Um, that was my first question. So um, you guys might see this familiar intersection at Bristow Road and Mount Zion Road, um, where you see the road close signs. Um, they were going to close this road to expand the intersection. Um, and to expand the intersection, um, they had to move these um, graves that they found. 
Um, so um, a little bit about the project, it was 11.5, it is an 11.5 million road project that will improve about five miles of this road in Kenton County. So the two lane road will become four lanes with a raised median and eight foot wide paths on both side. And that's according to the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet. And that is supposed to be done um, by the fall of 2022. So once I knew why the cemeteries had to be moved, I can move on to some of my the, the next questions that I had. Um, where was it? Um, the cabinet um, didn't wasn't too um, specific about exactly where the cemetery was. Um, they just said it was in an overgrown area near the fork in the road of Mount Zion Road and Bristol Road. Um, they said they didn't want to share too many specific details because they did have fear of trespassing and safety concerns. Um, but I still felt like we wanted to get just a little more specific because that way we might be able to find um, the next of kin, maybe some neighbors nearby or people who used to live nearby um, used to, you know, know about the cemetery before it became overgrown. So I did a little bit more digging. And so here's how I found people who knew more about um, this family cemetery. Um, so Joe Hayes' family has owned a farm east of that intersection since the 1960s. He was quoted in the article that, the first article that I wrote about the cemetery. So the way I found him is that you can look at property records through the Boone County PVA um, and they have an interactive map. Um, and basically you can just click around, um, click on a plot of land, it shows like the, um, the outline of the plot and you can click it and see who the owner is. And once you have um, the owner, you can also um, look up um, other records related to that name. So we use this, um, a, a company software called LexisNexis. Um, where I can type in anybody's name, um, where, which city I think they might live in, what county I think they might live in. It can be as broad as like, I think like Julia Fair lives in Kentucky and um, other um, public records will show up showing my phone number, um, if, if I'm married, um, how much property I have. It also shows um, what kind of licenses people have. Um, all kinds of information comes from LexisNexis, but what I really wanted was um, Joe Hayes's phone number, um, which is also listed in LexisNexis. So um, Joe is, I called about five or six surrounding property owners um, around the, that inter intersection and just said, hey, like, I know this is a really weird question, but this is what I'm working on. This is what I'm hoping to find. Call me back if you know anything about this. And Joe was the only one who um, called me back, but it only takes one good phone call to find out more information. And so, yeah, so when Joe called me back, he said he told me that his family owned the farm east of the intersection since the 1960s. And we'll get more um, info about him later on. Um, so also from property records, I was able to find um, Melissa Hoffman and Cynthia, um, I'm going to butcher her last name, uh, but they were the last owners of the row uh, of the home on in, at, at the intersection nearby um, the family cemetery. I was not able to get in contact with them for um, the article, um, but I, but one of the, my readers was able to get in contact with them and, and they, um, I don't think they knew much more about the cemetery. So again, that was from property records, but also from public records, I could see that Kentucky bought the house at um, 785 Bristow Road um, in March of this year for $172,000. So I knew that the that the state bought this house because they were going to, they had to demolish it for, um, to widen the road. So um, basically, that that's basically what the first article said. Like I, I was able to say where um, the cemetery was and like the past few people who might have been near it. Um, but I still didn't really know who might be living there. So at the bottom of the story, I put a call out to say like, hey, does anybody know anything else about this? Because I knew there just had to be somebody who knew more. 
So this is what happened after the first article published, and this is where I got the most information. This is when John Hoffman called. And without John's call, I wouldn't have known if maybe the Bristos might be buried here or if any, or if their family members had been buried there. So if John hadn't called, I wouldn't have been able to write any follow-up stories. And so he called me and he said he read the paper because um, one of, I, it was either like a neighbor or um, maybe his niece was featured in the paper somehow, someone he knew was featured in the paper um, and he came across the cemetery story. Um, and he said that he used to live at the house at 785 Bristow Road. Um, and so I was fascinated. I um, called him back right away and I asked him what it was like to, to live at this intersection. And so he told me that it was his chore to mow the family cemetery at the, this intersection. It was always his job to make sure that the, the grass was mowed. Um, and he told me that the like letters and the numbering on the stones were so worn that you could barely make out anything. He said there might have been a date from the 1800s on it, but um, it was so worn that you couldn't tell. And he thought that that might have been a birthday. So um, it was his job growing up to make sure that the cemetery still looked good. And I just thought that was fascinating. So um, John told me that his family always thought that the cemetery um, um, belonged to the Bristows, one of the first families to settle in Northern Kentucky. Um, and the reason that they thought that the Bristows were buried there was because um, Bristow Road was, it was part of the, is part of the intersection. And so um, I wrote about that um, and I started like Googling um, all about the Bristow family. And then I found, um, then I found Neil Bristow's family history blog. And he had a really, really extensive his family history blog all about the Bristow family and how they came to Northern Kentucky and all that stuff. And so it was just had so much information. So um, these are kind of the things that um, popped out at me when I read um, Neil Bristow's blog. Um, so he said by um, the 1850s, Reuben and Statira Bristow's were living on Banklet Creek, west of Independence in Kenton County. Um, they had a 160 acre farm named Maple Grove, um, according to the blog. And that creek um, is actually a 19 mile long tributary of Licking River, um, according to the Kentucky Tourism Arts and Heritage Cabinet. And so um, I was really curious to see how close this 19 mile long tributary was to exactly to 785 Bristol Road in Google Maps to see if this, um, you know, this very um, broad description of where this Bristol family was living in any way um, connected to the, the, the intersection in the road. So, um, uh, basically on Google Maps, it showed me um, a line from the start of Banklet Creek to um, 785 Bristol Road. So basically I, I traced where the creek went um, and how it went to a larger stream which passed Banklet Church uh, and then flew, flowed um, southwest of Independence. Um, right before it follows along a road named Banklick Road in Independence, part of the stream did curve to the west, and that does flow adjacent to the Bristow Road home. So I was like, oh, like this is probably where, or maybe this is where um, Reuben and Statira Bristow were living, and this is the description uh, of their home. Um, that, again, that was, you know, um, ju just a guess. This is based off of what information I had at the point. Um, but I wasn't sure, you know, I, I was still, um, not, I didn't have concrete information yet. Um, and then when I wrote about Neil's blog, I did reach out to him, to his email, 
that was listed on the blog and the blog was last updated in the early 2000s. I think it was 2009, so, so late 2000s. Um, I didn't hear back from him. So I, I was afraid that um, I, wouldn't, I wasn't gonna find out any more information. And then like a day or two after I published the second article, um, I did hear back from Neil. So he told me that no, the cemetery is not, does not belong to the Bristows because all of the Bristows are accounted for. So it couldn't be his um, family that is buried there. Um, but he did give me um, a good lead that I, I followed up on, and I'll tell you guys a little bit more about it. He told me about um, a book that was published in 1883 that said the Bristow and laws lived um, in the Gore at the Zion Road intersection. And so if you see on this map on, on the left, and I hope my cursor is, is popping up too, you'll see like there's a ton of Bristows over here. You got SN Bristow, Mrs. S Bristow, SB Bristow, um, maybe JJ or JI Bristow. And then at the Gore at Zion Road, this is the Gore, there was a Mrs. Conley. And so I was like, okay, now I need to find the Conley family. I also um, wanted to make sure that the, that the maps matched. Um, and so I just kind of um, compared side to side Google Maps on the left, which is the current day intersection to um, this map of independence from the 1880s. Um, and it does show that fork in the road. And so um, that was pretty good evidence for me to say that like, okay, like I'm looking in the right area. I should um, follow up to see if maybe the Conleys are buried here. Um, so at the end of the second article, I put out, I was like, are any Conleys out there? Like, please reach out to me. Um, and my coworker, Lillian Gibbs, is the person who found um, the following information um, all about the, the Conley family. So I'll go through what um, Luann found by looking at um, genealogy records. She is much more adept at looking at genealogy uh, records than I am. So um, she, she did this research for, um, for us. So Mrs. Conley is Alice Conley. She was born in England in 1832 and immigrated with her family in 1839. She was married to George Barry Connolly, um, who was older than her. Um, and so according to the 1850 census, um, Alice and George are married. Um, she, at this time, she is 17 and he is 39 and they have a one-year-old daughter. And they're living with his parents, Alexander and Nancy Connolly, who were born in Virginia, but they lived, but in 1850, they lived in um, Covington Ward One. In 1870, George, Alice, and their children are living in Covington Ward Two. Um, George was working as a jailer, um, and they have had several domestics um, living with them. In 1880, George passed, um, and Alice was living in the Independence area. So we're like, okay, we're getting to like the Independence area to this to this gorge in the road, maybe. Um, Let's see, and he is next door, and oh, and Luann made this note, he is next door to the Mrs. Con, so yes, Lewis Conrad is next door to Mrs. Connolly on the map, so it's definitely the same Connolly family, and there are also Bristow's nearby, as we saw. Um, I believe um, the 1890 census was destroyed, I think that's what Luann told, uh, told me in her email to me, um, so next she was able to look at the 1900 census. Um, Alice is still living in Independence. She's head of household with several of her children with her. Um, then she died in 1908, but she is, according to the census, she is buried at Highland Cemetery. So according to the census, um, Anne, Alice Connolly um, is not buried at, at this fork in the road. Um, her son, Arthur, took over the family farm in Independence. Um, he's there in 1910 but it looks like he might have mortgaged it. And by the next census, 1920, he's either lost or sold it and is living with his brother-in-law, William Rice, sister, um, Alice's husband, in Covington Ward 5. Um, and according to the census, all the Connolly fam family are accounted for. They're all buried at Highland Cemetery. 
Um, but as an aside, one of the Conlin girls, Mary, um, born in 1864, married Julius Bristow, um, but they are also buried at Highland Cemetery. So um, that is what I found um, based off of, you know, um, call out to readers and census records and looking at maps and comparing um, past maps to present day maps. Um, and then of course, Luann's um, really handy um, um, census work. So um, that's what I found. Um, so we still don't really know for sure who, who was buried at this fork in the road. Um, I do know that the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet has hired um, a company to move the remains. Um, so um, we, we just, um, we don't know yet. So if any of you guys know anything, please uh, chime in or uh, feel free to reach out to me. But uh, yeah, that's what I've got. Um, I know that we're supposed to have a quiz question. So um, my quiz question for you guys is, who is the last person or persons to um, live in the Bristow Road house? You guys can just put that in the chat, whether it be on Facebook Live or on the chat here on Zoom. Who was the last person to live in the Bristow Road House? You get a free pin and bragging rights <laughs> to tell all your friends. Carl, uh, Mer or Meredith, Meredith Cocker says the Dorfline family. Is that correct? Uh, let's see. Let me. Oh, I don't think I included it in the slide. I was, oh, here's the quiz answer. It's in my, it's in, it's my, it's in my speaker notes. Um, the answer is Melissa Hoffman and Cynthia Doerflein. Okay. So Doerflein family. So uh, Meredith Cowker wins the prize for the night. Congratulations to her. We'll make sure we get you that pin. Unfortunately, I don't have it on me or otherwise I'd show it to you, but pretend like I have it. Congratulations. Um, so we have some questions now uh, from people that were uh, watching, uh, both on Facebook Live and on here on Zoom. Um, Carol Fenbers asks, is LexisNexis free to use for everybody, or is it just a thing journalists can use uh, to find old acquaintances, as she put it? That's a great question. Um, I know that I have the version that um, the inquirer has paid for me to be able to use to be able to contact people. Um, I there might be a free version, um, but I know that the extensive like person it's called a person report that I can download. Um, I know that is something that we have to pay for. Okay, so it, it is a paid service, but it sounds like you probably can Maybe there might be a free version. I'd be yeah. surprised if there wasn't a free version. Right, yeah. And then maybe as you get more detailed information, you might be able to do that. So mm -hmm. Nexus Nexus is possibly a at least a smaller version of it for free. Um, Jennifer Miller on Facebook Live asks, were the graves unmarked? So you um, can do that sort of. So if you could just go over that. Yeah, um, just an, um, another addition to the previous question. The program that I use with, is within LexisNexis and it's called Accurant. Um, and so it's a program that LexisNexis offers. So um, so um, what was the question? Um, were they unmarked? Yes. Yes, yeah, so were the graves unmarked? Yeah, so the transportation cabinet um, said that they are unmarked graves, at least now. It's like in a very overgrown area. Um, and when John, John Hoffman hasn't lived there since, I, I mean, 30 years ago. And so, and that was when he was like you know a young adult yeah. and so back then that's when he saw the gravestones um and even back then he told me that some of them are flat and some of them were more above so yes they are currently unmarked um jennifer miller also asks um have you looked into the deeds of the property to find uh, more info on who might be buried there 
So other property around there, is there any other deeds about um, besides the Bristows? Yeah, so um, remember my, I mentioned my coworker, Luann Gibbs. So she told me that our next step should be to look at the property records at the Kenton County Library um, because um, yeah, that's where we could find out more information. So that, that's the next step. Okay, good. Um, who found the graves, um, grave sites? Yeah, I'm, I saw that question. I'm, I'm looking at my first article and I'm pretty sure, I just wanna answer this correctly. I'm pretty sure that the transportation cabinet um, found the graves when they had to do kind of a survey of the surrounding land because they, I believe they are getting federal funds as part of this. And so that required them to do this overview. I just want, I want to make sure that's right before I say that for sure. I'm pretty sure that's what, that's what happened. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Jeannie Crimebrink uh, asked, um, have you looked at any further into the deed history, uh, who owned the land before the Conleys owned the land? Um, um, no, we have not looked at to see who owned it before the Conleys. Um, so that'll be our next step once we um, start to look at the deeds at the um, library. Okay, yeah. Um, somebody, Bethany H Higgins, uh, says she works at the library and can let the Great. Let them know, start looking. Um, where are they re uh, moving the remains to? They are going to move them. Let's see. Um, they said they. Let's see. I want to say it might be Highland. I want to. Okay. Um, let's see. I I'm pretty sure that they are going to move them to Highland Cemetery. Um, let me check on that. I'll, I'll make a note um, and look into that, but it, it's, it's one in Independence. Okay, um, let's see, there was some other question. Oh, how many uh, bodies are buried there? So the ad from the transportation cabinet said six plus. Um, so um, that, that's what the ad said. So um, they didn't say for sure. I think they'll, they'll know more once they um, start digging. Oh, okay. Wow. Uh, that was a question. I don't think it's more, I don't think it's like dozens and dozens. It's a, it's a pretty small area. So it sounds like it's probably just a, like a family mm -hmm. together. Um, um, then that was a question from Patty Kaiser. Sorry, I didn't uh, mention your name. Um, let's see. There's a lot of questions coming up now. Uh, how about connecting uh, with longtime residents of the area to see if they know? So you've tried to do that somewhat. Um, have you had any other luck reaching out to people that live in that area? Yeah, so um, back when I started uh, my initial reporting on it with some of the software from the Boone County PVA office, I was able to look at the um, property map and um, click to see surrounding property owners. Um, and then I found their names and then I was able to find their phone numbers through LexisNexis and ask them, do you know anything about this intersection, this possible um, cemetery that's buried here? So that's how I, I reached out to like the, the really like most, the closest surrounding area. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I would love to try and connect with anybody who um, lived anywhere near this, this intersection to see if they knew anything more. Um, one of the people um, that you might want to get in contact with is uh, Dave Schroeder. He's the head of the um, library in Kenton County, and he may have some more in-depth records. If, okay. Um, Dave Schroeder. Great. I'll, I'll reach out to him. Yeah, he's he's a wealth of knowledge on everything Northern Kentucky history. Uh, so is uh, Paul Tenkati. He's a professor at Northern Kentucky University. That's T-E-N-K-O-T-T-E. -T -T -E. Another good person to ask lots of great. questions to. Any other questions tonight? Um, I'd be happy to take any other questions too, either about um, this article or just, you know, my reporting process in Northern Kentucky for anything else too. Any questions you, you've you always been wanting to ask a journalist, I'm, I'm ready for them. <laughs> I did have a question. So you do a lot of investigative journaling, uh, journalism. Do you mm -hmm. get a lot of um, issues with like when you're researching stuff with people not being so nice to you, I guess? 
Um, yeah, so so I get a big range of tone, um, depending on what kind of articles that I'm working on. Um, but, you know, I just stick to the who, what, where, why, and when questions. Um, I'm just, I know, I tell them I'm doing my job. I understand you're doing my job, but it's my job to ask you these questions. So, so, so yeah, I get, I get a big range of tones, both from um, people that I ask to, inter to interview, but also um, um, readers sometimes too, so. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, being, we're, I'm part of the Historical Society and we've actually had people, you know, um, submit articles about different families and then a member of that family that's, you know, much further removed will get emails back saying, well, that's not true, this happened. This yeah. Happened. We have to go yeah. back, change our article and everything else. Yeah, whenever I hear from somebody who um, is concerned that something that I wrote isn't accurate, I always tell them, um, you know, where I found the information, where they're finding their information. I always answer those emails as um, as best I can. So, yeah. yeah. Um, Carol wanted to know, Carol Fenbers wanted to know, where did you uh, move from and uh, where were you schooled at? Yeah, so um, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I went to school at Ohio University in Athens, Ohio, um, their, their, their journalism school. Um, and then I moved to Virginia for a year. I lived in the Shenandoah Valley in a little town called, or a little city um, called Stanton. Um, so I reported on um, two city governments there and one county. So um, way, way less than here. Um, so I did that for a year and then I moved here um, to um, Northern Kentucky <clears throat> to um, report with um, the Cincinnati Inquirer through the Report for America program. Um, let's see. Well, yeah, this is a good area for lots of governments. I mean, mm -hmm. with all this uh, different counties and little cities around here in Northern Kentucky. Yeah. Yeah, I see that Deborah says that um, Stanton, her people are there. Yeah, so there, there's a whole museum dedicated to Woodrow Wilson, um, and they're always like excavating in, in the back um, um, property that the museum is on, looking for buttons and stuff that might have been from that era. So yeah, Stanton is a very cool place. I miss it a lot. Um, let's see. Um, what are some of the most interesting things that you have yourself have researched besides, you know, this story? What are, what are some other ones that maybe you can remember from reporting that you really enjoyed? Yeah, so um, I think you, you mentioned it in the beginning, um, but um, last summer, um, you know, my job is to listen um, and then follow up on any community concerns. And so last summer, I heard from some neighbors in Villa Hills, um, that they were concerned about um, a chemical called styrene that was going to be stored just down the road from them. Um, they all lived along KY8, um, right along the Ohio River. And so it's like houses, but then like there's also this industrial um, storage plant. And so the storage plant wanted to store the chemical styrene. Um, and they were really concerned about it because it's the same chemical that leaked from um, an abandoned rail car in um, Cincinnati um, in the early 2000s that caused um, people had to evacuate the area for a few days. And so, you know, these people were concerned about an accident happening at the storage facility and styrene leaking everywhere. And so um, that's the first story that I wrote about that, but then I kept in touch with the residents um, and they actually submitted their own open records request to the state, um, to the state. And they found that, um, the company had actually, they had, so the, <laughs> it's a really complicated story, but basically in order for this storage facility to be allowed for the state to allow them to store styrene, they had, they were too, the company was, um, the facility was too close to a house, but no one, and so the company bought that house, um, and I was able to confirm that through um, public records and everything, and like, companies are allowed to buy houses, um, but I was curious if the people who, um, but in property records, I saw that there was the first name, like a family that sold the house and that that family sold the house to like another last name. And then like, a, like three weeks later that then the company bought the house from like the, the middle person. And so I was like, that's a really 
quick turnaround for somebody to sell a house. Um, and so I reached out to the original owners and I asked them if they knew that um, their house had been sold again a few weeks later to this company. And they said, no, they had no idea. Um, and then through more research, I found out that this middle person who, the middle person who um, sold the house to the company, he had done, he lives in, it was weird because he lives in like Louisiana. Um, and so I looked his name up and his company had done business with the storage facility in the past. So I don't know if I did a great job explaining that, but um, that's well, kind of like the most interesting story. Yeah. So um, one of the most more interesting things um, that that has come up. Um, Carol Fembers asked, when are you getting married? Next summer. Are you getting married here or are you getting married uh, in Cleveland? Back in Cleveland. Yeah, that's where everyone lives. Everyone lives there except us. So yeah, next <laughs> summer in Cleveland. <laughs> So you had to talk him into uh, moving down here as well. Yeah, yeah, we're actually um, we were um, we were long distance before I moved here, and when I moved here, he was able to find a job because it was in a bigger city. So yeah. Um, Paul uh, Weisenberg asked if um, the intersection was in Boone or Kenton County. Um, that is a great question. Let me look at the map here. I know there is. Um, I believe it is in Kenton County, um, but it's right on the, the edge, right right um, where Kenton meets, meets Boone. Okay. Um, Carol also went to ask, what happened to the Villa Hills chemical storage problem? What did, was the final outcome of that? So <laughs> based off of Villa Hills zoning ordinances, this company needed permission from Villa Hills to store this chemical because of it, the, the certain like toxicity um, from the chemical. And so this storage company had, a, had um, um, what's it called? Uh, they had like a time slot to talk to the, the zoning people um, at a public meeting about it. Um, but then once the neighbors, um, so they, cause they wanted to get a, like it's called, I forget what it's called, but it's like when somebody gets special permission to use property the way that that property was not designed or planned to be used. And so they were on, they were going through the process to get permission basically. Um, but then that meeting was canceled um, because all of the um, neighbors kind of had an uproar. Um, and that meeting, as far as I know, has not been rescheduled. Um, so still to be continued. Okay, so it's still an ongoing issue. Mm -hmm. uh, Kim Brake wanted to know, do you find it advantageous or not to report stories in an area you are not familiar with or from? Yeah, so every I love my job because every single day is different. Um, it's my job to become an expert on something very quickly um, on deadline, which, um, you know, it is a little stressful at times. But, you know, that's why um, we have community experts um, to reach out to, to talk to about things. Um, and that's why I'm a writer and not a speaker <laughs> too. So um, yeah, it, it's, it's every day is different. Um, so, so it's fun. It's definitely uh, um, this area, especially you'll learn as you live here longer, it's uh, very tight knit and everybody knows everybody. And that's, I'm coming from the West side of Cincinnati. It was true. And um, mm -hmm. learning that more and more down here in Kenton and Campbell County as well. Yeah. Yeah, Donna, it was the Villa Hills Board of Adjustment. Any other questions for Julia about anything from- I'm an open book. <laughs> <laughs> what was your favorite part about living or being from Cleveland? I guess that would be a good question. Oh, favorite part about being from Cleveland. Um, let's see, there's so many things. <laughs> I just, Hmm. I guess my, you know, I miss my family. They're all there. I think that they're my favorite part of Cleveland. I'm not a big sports fan. I'll go to sports games. So 
Um, and it was fun when the Cav um, Cleveland Cavaliers won the championship in, in 2016. Um, and then we had a bit hot streak with the World Series, and then that just failed miserably too. Um, but yeah, that's my favorite part of Cleveland. <laughs> I've only been up there once, and I was just to see the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So we were only there for like a three day weekend. So yeah, everyone goes there. Um, you know, it's like they don't even have the in induction ceremonies there anymore. Um, they're all in New York. So we're like, that's mm, weird. <laughs> feeling kind of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Um, it, uh, Patty Kaiser asked, your articles are published in the Inquirer and the Kenton County Recorder. Um, why is that they're on both? Yeah, so um, that I get that question all the time. So um, they are the, the same company. Um, the Kenton County Recorder just um, aggregates Kenton County specific news that um, Inquirer reporters um, write about. So, and I believe, it's the, I believe the Kenton County Recorder is weekly. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I'm not an expert on, on the print product side of things, but um, Kenton County Recorder, Campbell County um, Recorder, and Boone County Recorder, they're all the same company um, ran by the Inquirer. So um, that's why. Um, what about a project that you haven't done yet that you would be interested in researching? Whether yeah. Or from somewhere else? Yeah. Um, I've been really fascinated with um, like home prices in, in Northern Kentucky. I, I know that, and like growth too. I know that Boone County um, at one time was the fastest growing county in um, in Kentucky. And so I just am really curious about why it's um, growing so fast. Um, is our, our road infrastructure keeping up with the rate of growth? I'm, I'm sure we've all driven through Boone County at rush hour or just on a random Sunday afternoon. Um, and we all feel the effects of, you know, the Brent Spence only being down to one lane. So um, I'm always really interested in growth and like asking, is it sustainable and, and stuff like that. Um, and so, yeah, I know that's kind of broad, but I've been really fascinated with um, just how home prices are right now. So, um, Rob Davis asked on Facebook, where did the photos of the Bristows come from? The photos of the Bristows? Yes. Um, are you talking about the, the map? Yeah, the map. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. So that came from a book from 1883. And let me find... Um, I linked to it in my second article. I'm pulling it up now because linking was easier than typing out the long name of it, but I can find, I can find that. Let's see. Okay, it was um, an atlas of Boone, Kenton and Campbell counties. Um, from actual surveys. Is that the name of the book? Let me see. It, it might be. Yeah, I'll, I'll copy um, and paste this into the chat okay. like, so everyone can see. Um, and I'll show, I'll share the author. Now it's from 1883, you said? Yeah, that's the author. Um, and I'll put the publisher and time period too. And I found this is linked and um, it's on the Cincinnati Public Library. Oh, okay. Actually, you know what? I'll just share the link. That's easiest. So you're able to look at that online? Yeah. Oh, the question about the um, photos comes from Facebook. It was um, something that we, uh, the museum posted on Facebook. Um, she said she found them online. There was just some pictures of the family that she found online, the Bristos. Mm. So they must've been um, just out there on Google. Um, any other questions? So it sounds like this is a ongoing mystery and that we need some more research from from local people that are going to know a lot more about who lived there, you know, 100 years ago, maybe even 50 years ago, that may even, you know, be buried down there. Um, 
we want to thank you for joining us tonight. Um, so uh, BCM is, um, you know, operating right now. Um, it's coming back to full capacity with um, the different um, COVID restrictions going away. So please be sure to check us out. The Harlan Hubbard exhibit, the uh, diverse diamond, Negro, Cuban, and Latin American baseball exhibit, as well as BCM music coming back in a couple weeks. Um, that's all the time we have for this evening. Uh, thank you again, all the sponsors and supporters of the Beringer Crawford Museum. Uh, thanks to the staff, trustees, and members of the Beringer Crawford Museum. Uh, thank you to Tara who started this project and has been going strong for the last year. Uh, for more Northern Kentucky history throughout the week, check out our Facebook page and our YouTube channel where you can find the latest installment of Curators Chat where Beringer, uh, Beringer Crawford Museum Curator of Collections, Jason French takes us on fascinating places and artifacts from BCM's collection and across the region. Please like and subscribe. There will not be a North Kentucky History Hour next week. All right, so um, there will be no information coming out because there is no um, North Kentucky History Hour next week. We will begin having a bi-weekly schedule this summer, but we'll, we will be back on Wednesday, June 16th with documentarian Cam Miller. So please join us for that. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all then. My name is Joe Weber. Thank you again, Julia, for joining us. Yeah, thank you. This has been great. Everyone had great questions. Feel free to reach out to me anytime. Um, I put my email and my phone number in the chat. So um, please reach out if you have any other hints about who might be buried here, any other history things that you think might be an interesting feature story or anything that you think is newsworthy in Northern Kentucky. I always like to chat. Well, thank you again, and we will see you all in two weeks.